Hi, everybody. Welcome to the BC Wilcher Sports Show. I'm your host, Nate, and today we have another edition of our 50th anniversary series, celebrating the key figures, key moments, and incredible stories that have helped shape the history of wheelchair sports in BC. Today, I'm very fortunate to be joined by six-time Paralympic medalist, uh, former wheelchair racer, Michelle Stilwell. How are you doing? How are you doing today, Michelle? I'm doing okay. Thanks, Nate. Great. So we always start all of these interviews and these episodes off by just asking our guests, how did you first become involved in wheelchair sports? Well, that's a great question because uh, everyone who is involved in wheelchair sports comes from a different journey. And my journey, exactly. I was 17 years old. I sustained a spinal cord injury while piggyback riding on my boyfriend. I fell backwards and broke my neck. And, uh, you know, like many of our athletes, life changed in an instant. And so from that moment on, I didn't think sport was going to be a part of my life. It had always been a part of my life growing up. I played ringette, baseball, basketball, I ran track. Um, you know, if the boys were doing it, I was doing it and trying to do it better. Yeah. So it certainly was uh, that aha moment. I was very fortunate because my experience at the rehab hospital that I was at. I was born and raised in Winnipeg, so I went to rehab in Winnipeg, and there was a wheelchair basketball player who had come in to visit a family member who had happened to have a stroke. He saw me and asked me if I had ever thought about playing wheelchair basketball, and I honestly at the time had never really even seen wheelchair basketball, uh, but that competitive spirit in me and that sport person in me was very intrigued and so I started hounding doctors for day passes so that I could go to check it out and, and start basketball practice while I was still in rehab you know the first practice I went to I was still in my halo brace and wow. you know I I remember very vividly you know seeing uh, the athletes you know pushing up and down the court at high speeds and weaving in and out and doing these layups and just being a little bit mesmerized and, and just wanting to be able to try and, and thinking that I could do it. Nice. And so what were those first experiences like for you um, getting in a basketball chair out there in Winnipeg and uh, starting to push with that team? Sad. Very, very sad. Um, you have to think when you have a spinal cord injury, you, you basically become like a baby again. And yeah. you, I had lost a lot of function, especially upper body function being a quadriplegic. And, you know, the first time I tried to shoot a ball, uh, you know, barely got three foot above my head, never mind in the hoop. So it yeah. took uh, quite a bit of discipline and perseverance <laughs> to build up that strength and get to a point uh, where I could participate at an active level. You know, we had a great recreational uh, club in in Winnipeg with multiple teams that played at Lipset Hall every single Monday night. And, you know, I just started attending and started practicing. And, you know, I, I had a little bit of a benefit in the fact that quadriplegics don't typically play wheelchair basketball. Yeah. And with the classification system and the way it works, there is a deduction in points when you're a quadriplegic. There's also, when you play with the men, a deduction in points uh, for being female. Yes. So if I played with the men, I was counted as a zero. Yeah. So I um, I was sought after, I guess you could say. Yeah, a bit of a hot uh, commodity. Yeah, so that the bigger people like Joey Johnson and Bill Johnson, who I played with back then, could, you know, get in the key and be on the court and we could play a stronger lineup. And yeah. my sole purpose in life on the court was to set the picks and get them in the key. Yeah. And what was that like? Because that's something that's quite different in wheelchair basketball compared to the able body sport. Obviously, in able body basketball, there's still pick and rolls and screens and stuff. But the concept of, of sealing and picking in that way, where you can completely stop someone from moving, is very different from the able body game. Was that a difficult thing for you to learn? Or was that one of the things you picked up quite quickly? Well, I think the fact that I came from an athletic background um, made a big, big difference, right? I understood plays. I understood the concept of what needed to happen on the court. So I, I transitioned pretty easily in that sense. The yeah. hardest part for me was always just um, keeping up. 
right? I wasn't yeah. as strong. I didn't have all the functional skills that the other players had. And so I'd always be the slowest. Um, but I, I learned that there was a definite role for me. And, and I learned from some of the greats, you know, Jamie Borosov was a key person, uh, another class one BC yeah. wheelchair athlete who, who taught me so much about the game and, and what I could be doing and what I should be doing on the court in my role. Yeah. So when was it that you moved out to BC? Um, just for anybody who's watching or listening. Yeah, so I competed for, for Canada for three and a half years. And after the Sydney 2000 games, I retired and, and actually you know, got pregnant and had my son. So that was a little bit about my retirement and uh, had some medical complications. And we moved out to the island at that time for a sort of more subdued lifestyle, we'll say. And when I moved out to the island, there, there didn't appear to be any real wheelchair basketball players that I would want to continue playing with um, to keep my level up. But um, after uh, a little bit of time, I discovered there was a local club team that was very, very recreational. And so I started going out and just kind of shooting around with them. And before long, uh, they realized they needed coaching more than they had thought. And they yeah. asked me to become their coach. Oh, nice. So I started coaching the uh, Oceanside Tsunami and uh, took them through to uh, having never won a game to a championship. And, uh, you know, those are some great memories that, that I was able to build. And it was through that coaching experience, actually, where BC Wheelchair Sports had put on, um, you know, an, a weekend event for coaches. And it was coaches from all sports. And yep. that's where I met Peter Lawless, my okay. track coach. And we met on a basketball court and I was teaching him wheelchair basketball. And he saw me moving in my basketball chair and he stopped me and he said, what are you doing playing wheelchair basketball? You're a quad, right? And I said, yeah. <laughs> and I said, I play because I love it. And he said, but you're way better suited for track. You've got really fast fiber, uh, fast muscle twitch fibers and you'd be yeah. great in a track chair. You should try it. And uh, I certainly wasn't looking to uh, try a new sport. You know, I transitioned out of playing basketball into coaching basketball. I had a, you know, a little toddler at home, um, but Peter was very, very persistent. And he called me a lot and he emailed me and told me about opportunities and track meets and would I like to come out and I should come see and I should check it out. And eventually I gave in. Nice. <laughs> Quickly. Cool. All right. Now I just want to rewind a little bit and talk about Sydney before we move into the racing, if that's okay. Um, Cause you were able to win a gold medal and you were able to do that as part of a, a really dominant Canadian Canadian women's program that had so many individuals that we now talk about as like legends of the game or hall of famers. Like you had at the class one spot alone, you had like Jen and Marnie along with yourself uh, and then in some of the higher um, classifications, individuals like Chantel Benoit out of Quebec and um, obviously coached by Tim Frick, who is probably the greatest Canadian basketball coach of all time, able-bodied or wheelchair. What was that experience like? And what was it like to go to your first Paralympics with that sort of team? Well, you know, certainly what an absolute privilege to play alongside 11 incredible athletes who were so skilled and so experienced and taught me so much and not just taught me about the game but you have to remember I'm you know I started wheelchair basketball fresh out of an injury and those girls taught me so much about life with a disability and how to overcome and by watching them and seeing what they were able to do it made me believe more in myself and what I was capable of so those early days are um, super, super cherished for me, you know, and, and the skills that I learned from them, but, but also from Tim, like incredible coach. And, you know, that even when I transitioned into racing, there were so many um, of the skills that I had learned with psychological um, supports and, and, you know, vision training and things like that, that I still use today. Awesome. That's really great. And it's, it's for us, it's really awesome when we get to hear about kind of 
not just obviously the great physical benefits of sport, um, but what it does for athletes off the court as well. And that's something that's true regardless of what level you decide to take sport, whether you know, you're somebody that just wants to go to a recreational program once a week, get their little bit of fitness in, um, or for athletes like yourself who really took sport and pursued it at the highest of levels. Um, now, I'm also a little bit curious about how you were able to um, adapt and thrive in basketball as a quad, because that really is a significant rarity. It's something we don't see very often um, at all today, and especially not back then. I believe you were one of the first or the only um, quadriplegics to play wheelchair basketball at the Paralympic level. Um, so what was that experience like and what sort of adaptions did you have to make um, to figure out how to do those skills? Yeah, well, I, I certainly, I was the first Paralympic um, quad to play wheelchair basketball at that level. Um, and Lisa Franks followed me after on Team Canada. Yep. And, you know, it, it, it's- Another a, dual sport it, athlete. Yeah, it, it's sort of what I said earlier. It's um, knowing your role and understanding what you bring to the, to the court. You know, I, I knew I was never going to be the three-point shooter, um, but I also knew that if I- uh, practiced and practice and repetition makes habit and habit makes success uh, that I could you know do the layups that I could get the bank shot that you know if I was close enough um, I had the strength to do it uh, you know understanding that it was my passes into the big band right you know and how I lob those passes inside the key so that they can receive it and they get the, the points and I get the assist it's it's truly just understanding where your role is and being able to see the court. Cool. Awesome. So going back to where we were um, when you were talking about getting into racing and Peter Lawless's persistence, uh, getting you into a racing chair, uh, that's also something that throughout the course of a number of these interviews that we've noticed is that oftentimes it comes down to one or two individuals being really persistent about getting somebody out and getting them into sport whether it's trying a new secondary sport or something different or it's first getting or getting into sport um, after that injury and when they're first adjusting to their new situation. Um, so what was it uh, about Peter and about his persistence that finally made you decide, all right, I'm going to do this. I'm going to give it a try. I would say my competitive nature, you know, the, the day that I finally gave in to him and said, fine, I'll come to Duncan, which is about an hour from my house. We'll drive down. It was a Sunday. Um, you know, there's a track meet going on and I was, I said, I would come in and check it out. Well, of course, when we got there right away, it wasn't just about watching for him. He's like, well, since you're here, you might as well get in a wheelchair. And at the time, um, Karen March and Terry Thorson were competing that day. Yep. So I, I, in between Karen's races, I got in Karen's chair. It was a good fit for me. And Peter and I just went up and down the back straight and he was walking beside me and I had these ridiculous big fisted gloves on and I, I felt even more quad like having the big gloves yep. on. And, uh, you know, it was kind of rainy out and it wasn't a warm day and I complained a lot. You know, I, I remember saying to Peter, like, I don't get wet in basketball and it's air conditioned and warm at basketball and <laughs> you know, I don't regulate my temperature very well. And <laughs> yeah. But, uh, you know, going down that 100 meter street, he was walking beside me and they had the, the speedometer on the race chair, of course. And he said, how fast are you going? And I said, eight kilometers an hour. He's like, well, can you go faster? And so I started kind of punching the wheels a little bit harder. How fast are you going? Nine kilometers an hour? Can you go faster? And you know, that just kind of went along and now he was hopping and skipping along beside me with this big cheesy grin on his face. And at the end he says, you're like, how'd it feel? And I was like, yeah, it was pretty good, you know? And they said, do you want to go on a race? <laughs> and I looked at him and I said, um, pretty sure it doesn't work that way. I can't just show up at a track meet randomly and yeah. enter a race. And he's like, oh, no, no. I know people. If you want to do it, if you're willing to stay, there's one in like 45 minutes. We'll get you in it. So I said to my husband, like, do you want to stay? And I'm like, I'm, I'm willing to try it out, right? Because I like a challenge. Definitely am a person who likes a challenge. Yeah. Anyways, what Peter didn't tell me was I, I was kind of assuming it would be a hundred meter race, but it was the 1500 meter. 
Oh, yeah, the uh, big change. Yeah, big, big change. I didn't even know how to steer the bloody chair. Um, I got beat by a nine-year-old and uh, it took <laughs> almost 15 minutes for me to complete that race. I had people, you know, tennis clapping at the end and I was mortified and I thought that is never gonna happen again. And then the relentless pursuit of excellence began. <laughs> okay. And how did that um, relentless pursuit of excellence uh, go in those early days? How did you find the transition from basketball, obviously very different chair setup, but also from a team sport to an individual sport? What was that like for you? Well, you know, I think it was, it had a lot to do with my personal circumstances at the time. Um, You know, being a mom and and living in a small town, in New Bay, there wasn't a lot of options for me to be in a team sport for wheelchair sports. Um, unless I traveled a great distance. And so, you know, training became during nap time and, you know, it it became flexible for me. I wasn't expected to show up at a certain time at a certain day to meet people. Uh, I wasn't letting anybody down if I didn't show up because I had a childcare emergency. And so it was just very fluid for me and I was able to do it on my own time in my own way. Uh, Sometimes I would do shorter session in the morning and another one in the afternoon, just because that's what worked that day. Um, So I think that flexibility just really helped me out. And and once you started uh, competing, if I'm not mistaken, you achieved success fairly quickly. Your first world championships were 2006. Am I right in that? Yeah, I mean, 2005, I went to the European Championships and got my, my butt handed to me and came okay. in last place. And, and it wasn't a, a great feeling, but it opened my eyes to uh, what the level of competition was and where I needed to get to if I wanted to be competitive. And it certainly uh, lit the fire under me, I think I would say for sure. And so in, in 20. 2006 was the the world championships in Assen and those were my first world championships and yeah I'd say they went pretty well yeah and so what was that like getting that feeling of of being a world champion and being a world champion in in an individual sport so you knew that you were unquestionably the best in the world I don't think at that time I really acknowledged it it was sort of the um I was still learning so much and things were constantly changing. You know, I, I was still in a a borrowed wheelchair in 2006 from BC wheelchair sports, you know? And I remember before I, I I had raced one race and I was just leaving the call tent for the second race. And Clayton Guerin was a buddy of mine. And he's like, are you ready? Are you feeling good? I'm like, yeah, I think I'm good. Like I got this. I'm, I'm feeling really good about it. He goes, he looks at my chair and he looks at my compensator. He says, you're not ready. Your compensator's about to fall off. And I was like, pardon? I, I didn't even <laughs> know the mechanics of a race chair at that point, no. you know? And so then all of a sudden the pit crew's out and everybody's trying to fix my compensator because it was literally just yeah. hanging on. Cool. I'm, I'm happy you actually brought up um, kind of being in a BC Wheelchair Sports chair um, when you were starting out and things like that. So what kind of support early on in your athletic career um, did you receive from BC Wheelchair Sports or other organizations um, to help support you and get you, keep you engaged in the sport? Yeah, I mean, certainly, uh, you know, the first thing that comes to mind is the, the wheelchair race series that we have with uh, BC Wheelchair Sports that helps facilitate transportation and accommodations and subsidizes things so that we can get to races the wheelchair loan equipment, the being able to um, try things, right? You know, for me at the beginning to even get this expensive race chair and the gloves and the tires and the, all the additional stuff, it's a pretty expensive sport. Yeah, things add up real quick. Yeah, it adds up super quick. And so just having that financial backing to uh, bring down some of the costs and support and, um, you know, letting us know about grant programs and bursaries. And, um, you know, once I started making the provincial team, there was the athlete assistance program, uh, you know, just constantly. And of course, like once I made it to Team Canada, there was the carding money and own the podium and 
and I owe so much of my success to, to own the podium as well. Um, yeah. you know, it really escalated my ability to have the best equipment, the best testing facilities, the best travel opportunities to get to the races that I needed to be at. And, you know, there, there's a, a very long list of individuals who played a part in my journey, who helped me succeed. You know, uh, we talked about the difference between uh, uh, team sport and individual sport. And I mean, individual sport, yes, it's me on the start line. Yes, it's me on the podium. And, you know, it, it, ha it does come down to me not making an error in those precise moments and having put the work in, but I never did it alone. I had a whole team of people, whether it was massage therapists or coaching or um, sports psych and dietitians and, and BC wheelchair sports and own the podium, all those long, long list <laughs> that makes a successful athlete. Fantastic. And now obviously Paralympic Games, they're coming up in two weeks here for Tokyo. So let's talk a little bit about your Paralympic journey from Beijing onward. So your first games competing in wheelchair racing were 2008 in Beijing. Um, just talk to me a little bit about what that experience was like. Well, Beijing, of course, was my really first Paralympic experience experience as a as a um, individual athlete. Yep. And I went in sort of um, at that time favored to bring home the gold. And I will say along with that comes a whole lot of pressure, pressure that you put on yourself and the expectations you feel others are putting on you. Um, so just super grateful that it all turned out in Beijing. And I, I can't even put into words what it's like to wheel into a stadium with, you know, 90,000 people cheering and, you know, everybody, you know, when that go gun goes off, you know, eyes are on you in the 100 meter, right? It's a, yeah. it's a big event. And um, oh, I wish I could bottle that energy yeah. up and, and just have it every day. <laughs> yeah. It's four years of dedication, sacrifice, um, sweat, blood and tears for about 15 to 20 seconds. Yeah, well, and then and like, as soon as I was done in Beijing, it was like, okay, we're going to go to London, 1,460 days, training starts today. And, um, you know, and, and that was it. I made the decision in Beijing that I would go to London and I would try and repeat. Yeah. And so you went to London and when I've talked to uh, a number of Paralympians, um, both for this series, um, for our current Paralympic profiles and just a few other pieces over the years, almost everybody says that London is one of their favorite Paralympic games. What was London like for you? Would you say that, that that's a fair assessment that London did the games really well? London did a fantastic job of the games. And I really think, you know, when I think back to even 2000 in Sydney, Sydney did a great job of the games. And I think, you know, in Sydney in 2000, it was a, a defining moment for the Paralympics where we started to see things change. I had gone to the 1996 Paralympic Games as a spectator to watch Joey Johnson and other friends uh, compete at the games. And, you know, it was so disappointing and so disheartening to see the Paralympians literally treated like second class citizens, how the venues had shifted, you know, basketball was playing, being played in a community center. There was no effort to um, sell tickets and bring the, the awareness to um, the spectators who would have definitely uh, benefited from the experience of watching those games. And so, you know, 2000, Sydney bust students in from schools and uh, filled the stands and we played in the same venues and we had tons of screaming children and we had people who were wanting our autographs as we came out of the venues and things like that. Um, again, China was, Beijing was, was similar um, in the expect, in the, the capacity and the, the spectator and the, the display. You know, the opening ceremonies in Beijing, I'll never forget them. I've never seen 3,000 12-year-olds um, dance and in such unison 
<laughs> for 10 minutes straight right. with no teacher, you know, guiding them on what the next move was. It was quite fascinating. Um, but London just raised the bar and London did a great job. And I went into London more prepared and more supported. You know, I go back to own the podium and the supports that were in place for me. You know, I had everything and anything that I needed access to was given to me and provided to me to ensure that I would be successful. Great. And obviously London was another highly successful games for you. Uh, well, not, medals, not as it? successful as I would have liked them to be, but yeah. <laughs> and I mean, that's an, an interesting, it's interesting that you mentioned that because it's incredibly hard, you know, to win a title and become a world or a Paralympic champion. Um, but it's also, you know, from some of the interviews I've done or things I've read, it's even harder to defend those titles and to stay on top. Um, so can you talk to me a little bit about what that's like, um, I guess, psychologically or as an athlete, what that was like to know that everybody was kind of trying to knock you off the perch per se? Yep, for sure. Um, and I definitely felt it, uh, you know, and I got into my own head. I started questioning things. I thought people, I don't want to say they were after me, but I just you know, I would take my race chair to storage and when I would pull it out and get on the track, I'm like, somebody's played with my compensator. Somebody's been toying with it, you know, because I just, and then I would start toying with it. And then all of a sudden I wasn't going straight anymore. And it was just like my own ridiculousness in my head. And I let it get the best of me and it impacted my hundred meter. And, you know, you think that you spend 1,460 days training for one single event that lasts 20 seconds and in a blink of an eye you mess it up it it's hard right yeah. and it um took me a long time after to even want to talk about it and yeah. to get over it and realize that you know hey, i am just human yeah. and humans make mistakes and um yeah for so <laughs> For reference, um, for those viewers and listeners who don't know, as much as Michelle's saying she made a mistake and she messed up the race, she still brought home a silver, uh, had a gold and silver from, from London. Uh, and also for reference, for those of you who don't know, if we didn't mention it at any point, Michelle always competed in the sprinting events. So the 100 and the 200 meter, am I correct? 100, 200 in Beijing and London, and then it was switched in Rio. They didn't have the uh, 200, and I did the 400 instead. 400. And, and you raced in the very competitive uh, T52 uh, women's classification, which is definitely nothing to slouch at. A lot of really dominant and, and really powerful racers in that category, um, individuals like Carrie Morgan, who um, you had plenty of battles with in your career, if I'm not wrong. Um, so talk to me a little bit as well about the, um, the camaraderie or the rivalry within that group of women that competed in your division for, uh, I guess, the course of your career, because it was fairly consistent. Yeah, I mean, uh, you know, I wouldn't say Carrie and I were uh, best of friends, but we were very, very cordial to each other. And we did support each other and, you know, encourage each other and, you know, there were the other athletes, you know, the thing about the quad division is it can be wide ranging right and that's the thing about classification and, and spinal cord injury there are no two no one's the same similar, similar functional abilities you're kind of lumped into this group of people and and you know there were certainly ones that were weaker um, that didn't have the same function and you know those are the ones that i always tried to help and lift up and encourage and you know support and those are the ones i'm still Facebook friends with and stay in contact with. And um, yeah, you know, it's, I think as a whole, the Paralympics is, you know, like this little family and everybody kind of wants everybody to succeed. Yeah. And I think that's important because one of the big misconceptions around Paralympic sports, people who aren't in it is that, you know, it's not competitive and that it's all like friendly and fun and inclusive all the time. And in some respects, it absolutely is friendly and cordial and inclusive because there are things I've seen in, in the Paris sport world that you don't really see in a lot of able-bodied sports in terms of like 
competitors offering advice and support and different things. Although generally that support and advice is all around the things outside of the field of play. The things that make people's lives better, easier, um, really just, they help people adapt to whatever their individual circumstances based on their impairment may be. However, as soon as that starting gun goes off or the opening tip happens, all of that goes out the window and it is just as, or if not more competitive than, than some of the able-bodied sports in the Olympic games. Because well, there is that little bit of, I, I think to be a Paralympian, you have to have that little bit of an extra chip on your shoulder. Uh, I don't know, I might be around there. Let like, me know what you think. It feels like we have something to prove, right? Yeah. And uh, for sure, I, I'm very cordial, I'm very nice and supportive, but at the same time, if there's an advantage I can find with you know, going to the wind tunnel and figuring out what is my best outfit and how to style my hair, like you can even see those things transition um, through my games, through the pictures, right? Okay. You know, in, in London, I was wearing a full beanie skull cap because we discovered in the, in the um, wind tunnel that it was going to cut my time down with aerodynamics, even if it was like this tiny little fraction of something, you know, just not having my ponytail flowing um, made a difference. So that's you what I do. For those hundredths or tenths of a second. Yeah. And I think that's that's a really cool story. And those are actually the kinds of stories that we really like getting on this show. Those interesting little anecdotes that people either haven't heard or they wouldn't have thought of. So thanks for sharing that. I think that was phenomenal. Um, and I guess where we were at is we, we just talked about London. We passed London. Um, so now we're heading into your final games. Um, the real games where you were also, you know, incredibly busy outside of the track. You had a really <laughs> demanding job. Um, you know, you're a mom, you're raising a kid. So what was training for real like? And what are some lessons um, for time management that you might have for other athletes who are, you know, juggling different responsibilities and still trying to train? Yeah, you know, um, most of my closest friends uh, would say I lack spontaneity because I plan everything. I plan every detail from every time I work backwards. How much time do I have? What do I need to get done in that time frame? Um, you know, things are thought out weeks ahead of time to ensure the success. I don't like failure. And if I don't want failure, you got to have a plan and you got to stick to the plan. You have to be flexible with the plan because, you know, there are outside circumstances that sometimes can creep in. But um, certainly it's, it's really just being dedicated to that plan and having that long-term vision. You know, going into to Rio, I was an MLA, a cabinet minister, a mom. I was, you know, I had I had rollers in my apartment in Victoria. I had rollers in my office in Victoria. I had my rollers here at home. Plus I would get to the track as often as I could with Peter. And sometimes we'd meet in Duncan and sometimes it would be Victoria. And, you know, you just kind of make it work. I probably didn't sleep enough but I'm not a great sleeper to begin with. No. Uh, diet was huge, um, you know, and, and disciplined. Uh, going into London, and well, going into London, I was raw vegan. So I had, before we left for London, I had the entire meal plan that was going to be offered in the dining hall so that I could plan out every meal, when I was gonna eat it, what food I would have access to and what food I'd have to get at a grocery store. Yeah. And, you know, same thing in Rio. It, it, I had to know what was available to me, where I would get it if I couldn't get it um, and who was gonna support me in those things. Uh, you know, everything from, you know, you think little things like wheeling from your accommodation to the bus can sometimes be a bit of a hike. Well, I would just hang on to my coach's hand or back pocket or whatever so that I wouldn't tire my arms up, you know, and people might have saw that as being lazy. I saw it as being prepared. Yeah. It's again, it's all of those little things. Um, and I, I hate the fact that people have to reiterate it, especially on this show, because I feel like our audience probably knows this better than most, but whatever anybody says that like Paralympics or disability sport isn't real sport. I like point out these examples and I'm like, honestly, like 
have, like it takes just as much or if not more, you know, dedication, you know, to achieve all of these things, because not only are you managing all of that and everything else, but the reality is, you know, life is a quad or um, an individual with a significant level of impairment. There's things you've got to add. There, everything in your schedule takes that little bit longer. And so I'm sure for a planner like yourself, um, having to incorporate all of those things and like you said, the flexibility of if something happens, like how do we adapt to that? Um, and it, was that something that you learned through sport? Like did sport help you adapt um, to your disability and some of those routines in any way uh, in terms of like traveling and um, figuring things out on the road? Yeah, for sure. I mean, the first time I went on um, a wheelchair basketball trip with Team Manitoba, we went out east for nationals and uh, I went with two very large suitcases um, with every kind of device. Classic. Shower chair vibes. Yeah, you know, like <laughs> I'm going on my first like hotel expedition and I'm going to need a sliding board and everything like ridiculous things, you know, and now it's like, I think, oh, I'm going to go to a third world country and it's not going to be a problem for me. And I'm just going to take my little suitcase and some change of clothes. Um, you know, it's very different now. And, and that that's the learning. And the, those are the experiences I had that I gained from the other athletes, right? And having them show me because they had the lived experience longer than me. And um, I mean, planning doesn't hurt. Certainly being prepared doesn't hurt. <laughs> and now going back to where we were before, uh, I took you on a bit of a mini tangent there. Um, so Rio, you know, was your last games and you definitely kind of went out on your own terms, went out on top, which is the ideal ending for any athlete. A lot of athletes, you know, don't get that privilege. Um, but you finished up with two gold medals, two more to take you to um, six Paralympic medals in total. Um, what was that like for you to finish where you wanted to finish and, and end your career in such a dominant fashion? Yeah. Um... Let's just be clear it's six gold medals and one silver so it's seven okay. <laughs> my apologies my apologies That's we don't okay. have an in-house fact checker here silver one, so it's okay yeah. um yeah you know i think because london didn't go the way i wanted and then you know i decided that i would go to the world championships and prove myself at the world championships and then that didn't go the way i intended in order to prove myself because my main competitor at the time ended up dislocating their shoulder and so i never really got to prove that i was the best and um you know and and rio was just that i think you know i was very comfortable with acknowledging that i had spent nearly you know, 20 years of my life in elite sport and that it was time to move on and to do other things. And I was enjoying the other things I was uh, involved in. And, and uh, you know, I was not getting any younger. <laughs> so, you know, just um, so grateful that I had the opportunity to set those goals and achieve them and, you know, put the plan in place and be successful. And, and I think most importantly too, to, to have Peter with me in Rio, um, to share in those experiences, uh, and, and be by my side and, and really, you know, be that final coaching thing, you know, who had been there from the beginning. Not very often do we see athletes stick with their coaches that long. It's, and honestly, that's, that's a really, really great story. It's awesome to hear when athletes and coaches are able to create, you know, really powerful bonds um, and, you know, achieve all those goals. What do you think was the, um, I guess, the key factors in your bond with Peter lasting so long and being so successful? Um, I think, oh, well, I know what he would say, but I'm, <laughs> he, he would say, you know, physical performer versus mental performer. Um, so he's the brains behind the operation is what he would say. But, you know, I think it was just that we could talk openly about anything that we had really good communication. Sometimes he didn't want to hear everything that I had to say. <laughs> 
you know, maybe it was too personal, but, you know, it, it was playing a role in what was going on with my training or my ability to not succeed or to get the training in. And it was important for him to know the ins and outs. And I think open, honest communication was critical for us. Great. Well, that wraps up a lot of the sport and I guess athletic career orientated questions um, that I have for today's interview. But a big part of this series is talking about how wheelchair sports have changed and evolved over time and where we'd like to see them go in the future. Um, Because BC Wheelchair Sports has been around for 50 years now. It's pretty significant. Um, And parasport, wheelchair sports have changed a lot over the course of those 50 years. And you obviously, you had a, a very high level elite wheelchair sports career for 20 years. So what were some of the barriers or challenges that you saw early in your career um, that have changed? And what are some that you think still need um, fixing or improving within the Paris sport world? Well, I think certainly um, opportunities to, to compete, right? Um, you know, the when you think of how many people with disability live in the world and how many choose to compete in sport and then how many can choose to compete in the sport of their choice, Um, You know, there's not a lot of people. um, Yeah, these numbers are pretty low. Numbers are low, right? And so the only way we can raise those numbers is to ensure that those people who are living with a disability see the value in sport, see the benefits, uh, whether it's mental health or fitness or um, socialization, like sport brings so much. And whether it's parasport or able-bodied sport, those are critical pieces, you know, and can play a a huge role in, in, um, decreasing costs to governments when it look when you look at the overall health impacts and health costs of mental health or um, health conditions that you get from being sedentary or um, you know prone to infections and things like that so you know I would love to see governments putting more emphasis and more funding into sport and recognizing it as a prevention tool not just as you know, an activity and isn't it nice that we can compete. Grassroots level is critical to the development of the elite level. So if we're not starting them at basic level and giving them what they need to have those opportunities, whether it's, you know, have a go days or try days and, or whether it's a recreational club that um, has opportunities to compete against other recreational clubs or or athletes who have track opportunities and you know we I don't know I just I think the recognition has gone a long way but it still has so much further to go right and and that's part media um, you know and the promotion of the athletes seeing the athlete first not the person with the disability seeing us as athletes first we're not the afterthought Um, You know, when we start a 10K race and we're the first ones out in the lead and the um, the the MC doesn't know that they have a, you know, nine time world champion and world record holder on the start line. Yeah. Right. Like, yeah. Yeah. It's it's some of those little things that can be very quickly become big things and can make a really big impact for someone because. For a lot of people, sometimes if you don't see it, you know, you can't believe it. And going back to one of the earlier things you said in this interview, you know, like the first time you went out to wheelchair basketball and you saw just how fast everybody else was going. And even though at that point it was probably like, wow, like, I don't think I could ever, you know, get to that speed, but you saw it. And then, and then that thought all of a sudden started to change from, I don't think I can get to that speed to, I wonder how I can do that, you know, and that those light bulb moments, they don't happen for people if they don't see it. And that's where that visibility and that media attention is so important. So we're really excited at uh, BC Wheelchair Sports just for the amount of coverage for these Paralympic Games that are coming up uh, and what that's going to do. And hopefully, um, you know, we can get more people out racing and get more people into sport, um, whatever that sport may be and whatever um, an individual's ambitions can be, whether, you know, it's an, it's a young kid who, realizes that they can play sports for the first time or you know it's somebody in their like 30s who's been injured for 10 years and is finally like oh you know I really want to find something new to get moving and get active really for anybody to just 
take a chance and try something new and hopefully change their life. Um, so yeah, that's great. And I guess going off of also what you were saying about the grassroots, one thing that's really prevalent in the parish board community that we did touch on briefly is that notion of giving back and paying it forward. And it's something that you did throughout your career, um, you know, often providing other advice and support um, to up and coming wheelchair racers. And it's something that now, you know, you're starting to do more of on the island, dropping in at their active kids program, um, helping uh, young kids and youth with disabilities who want to start getting involved in sport. What does it mean to you to give back and to share your experiences and also to get that experience as somebody on the other side of where you once were? I think that's how it, it develops and grows and continues to flourish. It's by having the alumni who stay involved. And, you know, it's whether I'm mentoring somebody and encouraging somebody or randomly stopping somebody in a mall who I happen to notice is limping and say, hey, do you have a disability? Do you think maybe you'd like to try? Um, or whether it's, you know, sitting on committees and boards, you know, I, I support Athletics Canada and the Canadian Paralympic Committee and the International Paralympic Committee on, on various uh, committee positions so that I'm giving back and using my, my voice to advocate. Um, and those are big pieces, you know, you don't just um, end your career and sign off. You, yeah. you know, this was a key part of my life for 20 years and I by no means want to give it up and I want to stay involved and I want to support the next generation and encourage people to see what is possible and uh, for them to believe in their abilities. We have a new injury here in Parksville. He's super keen and he was an athlete prior to his injury. I just see so many similarities between us and I am so eager to get him going. I've got him in a race chair now and I, I gave him my old rollers and we're getting him going and it and it's like there, he took a picture the other day of himself and he's just got this big grin on his face in yep. this face chair. And I thought, that was me, you know? And, you know, he's gonna go far and, you know, it's, it's gonna be great and it just, it feels good. Yeah, and those moments, they really matter. And they're the things that people take with them. Um, and, and they're sometimes the moments that we forget, you know, until we take a moment to um, take a push or a step back and, and reflect on, on where things are. So. Yeah, it's really, we're really grateful, you know, um, for people like you who give back and who give their time um, and their effort um, to help support that next generation. So that wraps up all of my questions for you now, Michelle, but now I'm kind of going to see the floor to you again and give you a chance to kind of mention anything or say anything that we might have missed or if there's any message um, that you want to get across either about yourself, um, about wheelchair sports, um, or about the Paralympic Games that are coming up. Oh, goodness. Well, I mean, number one, the Paralympic Games uh, coming up, make sure you watch and you cheer and you get behind and you share on social media. And the more that you share, the more people will learn about our sports and learn about our athletes. And those are fantastic opportunities. You will be um, inspired, I think, you know, uh, oftentimes I don't like that word. Yep. Uh, but, you know, whether you're an Olympian or Paralympian, there's inspiration in our sport and what we achieve. So I don't think there's anything wrong with that. And for those up and coming athletes who are currently sitting at home watching Netflix, you know, get out and give it a go and, and just give it a try. Don't be afraid to fall down and, and just get back up again. And you will realize how much fun you've been missing. All right, well, thank you so much, Michelle, for joining us. We really appreciate it. Um, to all of our viewers and listeners who have enjoyed this interview, um, thank you so much. Please be sure to like, share, subscribe, um, and stay tuned for more episodes of the BC Wheelchair Sports Show, um, both our 50th anniversary um, special alumni series and also our Paralympic profiles and some general episodes that we'll be bringing you throughout the next few months. Again, you can access this show on Facebook, YouTube, and wherever you get your podcasts. Um, for BC Wheelchair Sports, my name is Nate, and we can't wait to see you next. Have a great day, folks.